I would say that that is the exception that proves the rule. A and I'm, I'm trying to articulate this thought for the first time aloud, so let me see if I can get it right, which is that shareholder capitalism, which is mostly what governs most public companies these days, um, creates conditions and incentives that make it really hard for the values that get stirred up when people start a mindfulness practice, makes it really hard for those values to find a home, despite what you've heard mm -hmm. at Aetna. And that's why at most companies, even if they have a mindfulness program, you still don't see them going beyond sort of the token mindfulness program to really address things like, well, are your lowest paid employees able to earn a living wage and take care of themselves and their families? And those kind of decisions you hear, you know, bump up very quickly against the spreadsheets that human resource officers model and ultimately against shareholders. Um, you know, I forget if, uh, to what extent, if any, you had pushback from shareholders. But you can imagine that if a company that wasn't throwing off tons and tons of money on profits like Google, like no one cares if Google like gives away free food and runs a meditation program because they spit out cash every quarter. Mm -hmm. But what about that company that isn't so profitable? Do they have permission to also take care of their employees? Or do they have to be a profit center and a huge engine of profit for their shareholders before Wall Street gives them permission to do basic things like take care of their employees and make sure that people can pay their health care costs without going broke. And, and the truth is, the way capitalism is practiced these days, the answer is usually no. And I, and I think that is up to the leadership of the organization. So when I met the day I announced, I had 240 million of the 350 million shares at the JP Morgan conference in California, mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And I didn't get one pushback. I had one shareholder, who was our largest shareholder, say, I'd like you to double my dividend. And I said, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to invest in the company. Well, how about more share buybacks? No, I'm not going to do that because I'm investing in the company. Well, what if your large shareholder insists that you do that? I said my largest shareholder should get the hell out of my stock. And she did, all 34 million shares, at $39 a share. She got back in at 109 <laughs> So she missed the opportunity. And, and so I think it's a stewardship argument. Yep. So I lowered everybody's expectations. So I'm not going to give you 15% every year. I'm going to give you seven, and I'm going to invest in the business. It's going to grow. It ended up generating 17. But you have to have that. You have to reset the expectations. Because really good, any real good organization has to generate a margin to continue to invest in their mission. Um, and mission-led organizations, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, generate margins, put it back into the company. I don't write a check to my shareholders for every dollar I make. Mm -hmm. They don't get their share of the, the earnings of the company. It goes back into the company. And what they do is they buy from other shareholders low and hopefully sell higher. Um, that's you know the, the share game. And the American public doesn't understand this economic concept, which is a hard, a hard thing to, 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 to explain to people. But in the end analysis, if you manage your shareholder base to the expectations of what you believe the investment priorities and the mission of the organization are, I start every conversation with my shareholders about what our mission is, mm -hmm. then they can't argue with me. And if they don't, they can just get the hell out of our stock. Mm 